Good morning. Um, you've just heard the Prime Minister uh, speaking about how we achieve uh, economic growth and jobs in the UK uh, and in an environment where there is uh, intensifying uh, international competition. Now, overall, um, global growth is a good thing. Um, it's clearly right, and we should welcome the fact that there are millions of people who used to live in desperate poverty um, clambering their way out uh, to better standards of living, and they also expand the markets into which our companies sell. Uh, as the Prime Minister pointed out, as a consequence of that, uh, we are now getting rapid growth of exports to countries like Brazil uh, and India and China and Russia and Turkey uh, and the rest. And I think we all accept that we now have to do a great deal more to offset years of neglect um, by this country of these uh, emerging markets. Uh, but the, the other side of the coin is that uh, as these countries grow and expand, uh, they also generate more commercial competition. Uh, and every other developed country, including a recovering United States, is relying on these markets to grow uh, and looking at how to be more competitive. So uh, we don't live in a uh, zero-sum world, fortunately, but it may not feel like that in countries like ours that have been struggling to grow. Uh, and our starting point, of course, is that uh, in the UK we have had a difficult time. Uh, though there are reassuring statistics now emerging about employment, uh, the fall in unemployment, about the level of business startups and others. And I do sense, cautiously, uh, a more upbeat mood in business. If it's to be sustained, uh, there has, however, to be a very clear pathway uh, how we get out of this crisis and how we sustain future growth. Now, in the short run, I'm, by that I mean the next year or so, uh, growth will depend on the expansion of overall demand. And we do recognize that in the last two years, with a combination of the euro crisis, the persistent challenge of dealing with the legacy of deficits and damaged banks and a collapsed property bubble, uh, compounded by the effect of uh, energy price increases, it has been difficult to do that, and it's been small wonder that, that business confidence has been faltering at times. Now, we are determined to do what we can in government to sustain demand and confidence, and our determination to put in place a credible plan for the deficit, uh, which has been painful, but something we've had to do, has allowed the government to pass on the benefits of a credible balance sheet to the wider economy. And that, and our independent monetary policy, is why we've been able to introduce innovative schemes like funding for lending. And we will not sit on our laurels uh, until the economy is growing strongly. But in the longer term, what matters for growth is a combination of things. It's the attractiveness of the investment climate, it's the quality of the physical infrastructure, and it's the supply of high quality, skilled human capital. Now, some government decisions um, have an immediate impact on the economy, notably infrastructure projects and regulatory certainty in the energy sector. And I do recognize, and the Prime Minister talked about this in his address, we do recognize the frustration in the business community about the way in which some of these things have been moving slowly. I want to focus, however, on human capital which is the investment in training and further in higher education, as well as schools and research leading to innovation. And I pose the question, you know, where is this going to come from? Who is going to pay for it? Now, most of, most of it, of course, comes from you. Um, it comes from companies. Uh, and for the, however, for wide swathes of training and education, there are valuable spillovers of benefit which means that the private sector needs support from the government. Uh, and that's why I have been so determined to protect and promote uh, apprenticeships and to put higher education onto a sustainable financial footing. Now, I do recall that uh, when we embarked at the beginning of this government on making difficult
cuts uh, in pursuit of deficit reduction, we enjoyed the wholehearted support of the CBI. Uh, but the CBI was also critical of some cuts in particular, and it argued for more spending on education and science. Now, we're now in a position where the government faces serious financial constraints on account of a large fiscal deficit, uh, which we recognize will continue beyond the middle of this decade. And we cannot repeat what we did before. Uh, we replaced uh, grant funding with student loans repayable from graduate incomes. It was unpopular, but we had to do it. But now, the main areas of higher education that still enjoy financial support from the government are areas like engineering and science and the research ring fence, which are the absolute basic minimum that we need to protect Britain's competitiveness. Uh, indeed, in the coming years, we're going to face growing calls on government in two areas in particular. Uh, the first is in post-18 vocational education. We've made a big step forward in partially funded apprenticeships, which have increased to over one million in the last two and a half years, a growth of over 60%. And we're shifting towards an employer-led system where the funding flows from the companies to the trainers, not the other way around. But apprenticeships only cover a modest proportion of the student leader population, and we badly need a system of training that deals better with the so-called NEETs, who aren't in employment, education, or training. And this means having a real ambition uh, for the further education sector. Uh, the second area is research and development before commercial innovation. Now, I am delighted at the progress that we have been able to make with the Technology Strategy Board, uh, introducing the catapult centers in advanced manufacturing and cell therapy, new offshore renewables and space, with the connected digital and transport technology catapult still to come. Uh, even though we've managed to protect the science budget from serious cuts, uh, we must, however, not be complacent. Uh, we've noted the criticisms in the past from the CBI that the valuable SMART awards and knowledge transfer partnership have been squeezed, and we're trying to give priority to supporting innovation when we have the opportunities to invest more. Now, we do need to build on our excellence in science uh, and improve how we turn great ideas into great businesses. And just last week, the Chancellor laid out eight technologies where Britain could be a world leader. And you only need to look at some of the proposals coming forward at the moment from Nesta and Case and others to see that there is no lack of opportunities in this country. There has, as a consequence, got to be some prioritization, uh, connecting public spending area in the areas which contribute to recovery and growth, and not on the politically soft options. Uh, and this is an issue that I've spent a lot of time reflecting on in recent months uh, during the work I've been doing with colleagues across government to formulate a new long-term program for UK industry. Now, the resulting industrial strategy is underpinned by two principles. Uh, first, there's a recognition that it's necessary to plan for the long term, uh, to prioritise activities, or our activities, and allocate resources accordingly, just like any successful company does. And secondly, there is an understanding that government must work with, in partnership with industry, to tackle genuine market failures where these occur. Now, this doesn't mean picking winners. Uh, we will be flexible in our approach. Uh, we'll rigorously evaluate where we can use our resources best. Uh, and we are open to new disruptive technologies and industries as they develop. This isn't about entrenching uh, and protecting old industries. It's ensuring that the UK is ready to take advantage of new opportunities as they develop. Now, nothing fits these two principles as clearly as getting the skill system right. Uh, and the task is a long term. Uh, if we're going to tackle the skills we need in 2020 or 2030, we have to start now. Uh, and the benefit that the whole economy receives from talented people uh, makes investment in skills a classic uh, market failure requiring permanent government attention and support. Uh, and this is also an area where working with business is absolutely essential. 
uh, too much failure has come in the past from the government ignoring the input of industry. And that's why it's so welcome that the CBI has chosen this theme in its report, First Steps, a new approach to our schools. Now, for so long, um, to ensure long-term success, we have to plan to ensure an adequate supply of skilled workers. And there are many strands to this work. Uh, we've got to remain open to the many talented and entrepreneurial people that throng to our shores to learn, work, and invest, because that's uh, how, over the years, Britain has gained so much of its industrial and business expertise. Uh, being open for business, which is our declared aim in government, means being open to overseas talent as well as overseas investors. It also means we need our skill system to produce people with the soft skills required by all employers, such as the ability to cope with the routines and demands of the workplace, as well as equipping them with the management and the leadership skills they need to progress. And I, placed, uh, I applaud the emphasis being laid by my colleague, the Secretary of State for Education, on raising the standards of maths and English in school and on standards in general. But we also have to develop credible pathways of vocational education in schools, including engineering, and to introduce school children to the importance of enterprise and entrepreneurship. And there is a clear and growing demand in British companies for specialist technical skills. Time and again, uh, large manufacturing companies come to my department and tell me they're worried about looming shortages of skilled engineers, and it's one of my absolute key priorities uh, as business secretary to address this problem. Uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering has recently published estimates of long-term demand for engineers, and there's no doubt that these are, to say the least, uh, very challenging. Uh, my department's chief economic scientific advisor, Professor John Perkins, who is himself a, an eminent engineer, uh, is working closely with the academy and others to see what more can be done including areas such as uh, broadening out the diversity of the profession uh, and its uh, currently rather pronounced gender bias and helping people return to the profession. And on this, I'd like to commend uh, Alan Cook, who's chairman of Atkins, formerly BA Systems, for picking up and running with the idea of a ta talent uh, retention scheme, which is an industry group set up to match jobs with engineers leaving the defense sector and now running with more than 500 companies registered. It's currently still free for SMEs. And I'm pleased to announce that the talent retention scheme, which is now funded and managed entirely by the business community, is being extended, and it's going to be working with universities so that uh, university graduating engineers can put up their profiles and search for jobs. Effectively, it will create an eBay for talent. And the industry group sees this as an important move towards supporting young people in engineering and manufacturing jobs, and it will be progressively using the talent retention scheme to source new and experienced talent in the years ahead. Now, the constraints on the supply of engineers is clearly complex, and it's rooted in a number of factors, ranging from the influence of parents and teachers uh, to the outdated perceptions of industry that are a world away from the very well-paid, rewarding, dynamic careers that are now on offer in engineering today. And I'm always astonished by how different engineering is from the stale image of repetitively badly paid uh, metal bashing that is still quite widespread. Uh, I noticed on recent visits I made one to, for example, to the McLaren factory um, down in Surrey, which is a bit more like a spaceship than a classic image of a factory floor. And I noticed on recent visits to Jaguar Land Rover and uh, Toyota production line, increasingly high percentage of women doing work that was hitherto regarded as an exclusively male occupation. But even as we gradually turn this perception around, by the time young people reach the age when they want to choose engineering, they may have failed to gain the education and skill te technical skills they need to take it forward. Uh, and that's the reason we're running a number of programs designed to increase the numbers passing through every stage of the pipeline. Uh, the Sea Inside Manufacturing Campaign, 
which I know many of you have supported, has been a successful way of opening young people's eyes to the career opportunities available in engineering by showing them round some of the UK's leading industrial companies. And complementing this, we've got uh, programs such as STEM ambassadors, uh, apprenticeship ambassadors, uh, Make It In Great Britain, and the very successful Big Bang Fair, which inspires the very youngest, and this year involved 170 organizations with over 50,000 people at the main event in Birmingham. And only last week, I opened the skills show in Birmingham. We welcomed 100,000 uh, young people over the following three days to competitions and talks built around the idea of skill. Uh, there is, in addition, the prestigious new Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering that's been launched which uh, some of your companies are supporting. Uh, a range of partners have contributed to the endowment of a prize fund, and the £1 million pride will now be awarded biannually by the Royal Academy of Engineering. It has a real potential to inspire future generations of engineers. Uh, now, many manufacturers and professional bodies are already proactive in reaching out to inspire and inform young people. Uh, and it's gratifying to see Engineering UK's Tomorrow's Engineers program take this to the next level by helping companies and ac academics join forces uh, to engineer a vital step change in long-term perceptions. Uh, Lord Heseltine, in his uh, recent report, has supported the move towards greater business engagement in the school curriculum, and he's right. Uh, and we're working with the career service now to connect businesses, local enterprise partnerships and schools to make this happen. But once their interest has been engaged, we have to ensure that opportunities to develop the prerequisite skills are available. And the university technical college system provides a model uh, for meeting that. Uh, the University Technical College program has, will establish 24 new colleges by 2014, and that's offering around 20,000 14 to 19-year-olds rigorous training in a number of engineering, science, and technical disciplines. Details of the first 15 were announced in May, and they include partnerships with household names, uh, British Airways, Jaguar Land Rover, Virgin Atlantic, and, and others. However, following technical education, uh, would-be engineers need access to jobs so that they can start and develop their careers. Uh, if an adequate pipeline of British engineers is to be created, it can't be down to government and future engineering graduates through their fees to do all the financial heavy lifting. Uh, I hope we can see a reciprocal number of industrial sandwich schemes paid in trainships and individual sponsorships from the private sector. Uh, one area which, as I've already noticed, we've seen some real progress is in apprenticeships. Uh, and the investment we've ploughed into apprenticeships over the past two years has produced some record numbers. Now, I don't pretend for a moment that this solves the skill supply problem as a stroke. It, it, it doesn't. But they are an important part of the solution. And specifically, apprenticeships in engineering and manufacturing technologies have doubled in recent years to over 50,000. And we recognize that in focusing on quality as well as quantity, uh, we need more advanced apprenticeships in engineering, construction, and digital skills in particular. Now, smaller employers uh, are going to need extra help in absorbing the costs of taking on apprentices, and so we're offering grants of £1,500 to support those with fewer than 1,000 employees that haven't hired an apprentice for the last 12 months. And we've recently streamlined the process to make it as easy as possible for employers to get access and recruit apprentices. Uh, it's gratifying also to see that the bids for the employer ownership pilots, which I announced on the 11th of September, have included a number of very high quality bids from employers seeking to meet specific engineering needs. And also, uh, the development and delivery of high level apprenticeships equivalent to degree level is being supported through a £25 million fund that will build the engineering skills base for a range of disciplines, including environmental technologies, space, energy, and utilities. Our commitment to engineering is just as strong in the higher education system. Uh, since 2009, the Higher Education Funding Council has invested in measures to increase the demand and su sustain the supply of what we call strategically important subjects. 
uh, within STEM, that's uh, engineering and technology, maybe far the largest of these in terms of undergraduate numbers. And this year, you may have noticed that when we introduced the very controversial new system of student financing, demand to study engineering held up considerably better than any other subject. And that, I guess, reflects the fact that students take an increasingly hard-headed view about their career options. Uh, in addition, earlier this year, we invested £12 million more through the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in new doctoral training programs in four of the centres that they operate, uh, emerging uh, macromolecular therapies, continuous manufacturing and crystallisation, ultra-precision and composites. And each training program will support three cohorts of doctoral researchers and will provide specialist research and technology specifically for advanced manufacturing. And this program will reinforce the £300 million research partnership fund that will be used to leverage in a billion pound investment in science and R&D collaborations. Uh, this fund will support the creation of more cutting edge research facilities and help promote long-term strategic research partnerships between universities, businesses and charities. Uh, we've already given the green light to several of these, a £60 million partnership between Birmingham University and Rolls-Royce to create a casting and simulation research facility, a £92 million partnership between Warwick University, Jaguar Land Rover and Tata Motors, uh, a European Technical Centre for a new National Automotive Innovation Campus, and there are about 15 of those very high-quality projects. Now, all these interventions are designed to stimulate innovation, uh, reduce the risks associated with investment in new technologies and R&D, and bolster the skills pipeline all the way along. The ultimate aim is to nurture a thriving innovation ecosystem which attracts the most talented people to careers in engineering and science. So, if I can pull the threads together in conclusion, I just want to stress that I am a realist, and I do recognize that the initiatives I've outlined will take time to bear fruit. It takes over a decade to persuade a young person at school to take an interest in a career in engineering and for a fully qualified professional engineer to emerge at the other end. It takes time. I know, too, that more needs to be done to reverse the constraints on skills that have resulted from a historic, serious lack of investment. And it will be necessary to win battles in government to prioritize this agenda. But nevertheless, I am confident that we can seed in bolstering the skills base as we develop our long-term plans for UK industry. And this is important uh, because potential shortage of skilled workers is not only a British issue, but it's a global one. Research recently published by McKinsey highlights a shortage of 40 million highly qualified uh, skilled personnel by 2020. So it's an ambitious agenda. Uh, and I and my colleagues stand ready to work with the CBI and others as it's implemented in the months ahead. Thank you very much indeed.